Episode 128 for September 8th, 2020. I'm Steve Foder. I'm Chip Hessenflow. And I'm Pam Fedor. And we are here for our second book in our new book club. We're so happy to have everybody here with us. This week we are reading the first four chapters of From Hell, written by Alan Moore. And it, it has art from Eddie Campbell, Chip. Chicago's Eddie Campbell, Steve. He's from Scotland. He lives in Chicago. Come on now. I still call that Chicago. Come on now. <laughs> uh, interesting enough that he, he this is a, a Jack the Ripper story. And uh, he lives in the, the hometown of, well, one of the hometowns of H.H. H. Holmes. So we certainly chose this book for some really good reasons. Um, one of them is the fact that this is a graphic novel. The art is by Eddie Campbell. Alan Moore is probably one of the most celebrated comic book writers, um, graphic novel writers of the last hundred years. Probably the only person I can think of maybe uh, stands on uh, a higher pedestal would be Stan Lee uh, and uh, Jack Kirby who put together the Marvel Universe. But Alan Moore certainly was the author who took the uh, comic book writing and, and elevated it to more of an art form. Uh, uh, certainly something that is going to be aimed at more of a uh, grown up audience. And Eddie Campbell, the artist who drew these pictures, uh, boy, certainly gives us some context for the words that Alan Moore wrote. He certainly does. He, he, he chose sort of a, a, a scratchy, uh, dark writing that's that, uh, in fact, he, he even mentions that it's purposely vague at times because they don't really know all the facts. And because they don't know all the facts, there's the plausibility that um, maybe the story isn't really what they're, they're trying to say. And I enjoy the black and white style of it, uh, just the same way that I enjoy 1930s horror movies more than I enjoy the modern horror. There's something about color that adds more to the gore, and, and the gore of the things that we see in these first four chapters are muted by the, the black and white for me. So the collected edition came out in 1999. There is an updated colorized version uh, that what the color was uh, performed by Eddie Campbell that's going to be released uh, September 15th. So next Tuesday of this year, obviously they, they were looking to uh, renew the sort of the interest in this story. Wow. I, I actually find it hard to believe that they would do a color version of this. I feel like the black and white is so perfect, you know, just to, to embody the story of this. That's very interesting. I'll have to check that out. And again, I, I'm not a fan of gore. I'm not a fan of uh, adult situations and pictures of such things. So thanks for this book, Chip. Um, but, but the black and white mutes it for my mind. And his style, that scratchy, those vertical lines that are the quote-unquote coloring of the, the setting is very interesting to me. And I really like how he has a number of different styles. And so the scene that you're thinking about, my dear Steve, the one right at the beginning that was perhaps a little more adult than you had desired, is drawn in a really, um, it's really fascinating because it's quite graphic in the sense that the characters are, you know, fully, fully realized and nude, but it's not erotic. And so I think he does a really, really nice job of sort of capturing that. And then in some parts, he does that sort of checkerboard. Um, he does the, the quick vertical and horizontal lines intersecting in ways that really create the cityscape in a very surreal and real way at the same time. I, I think the, I don't know enough about art to talk about it. I don't know all the terms to use, but I'm very, very impressed with the different moods he creates in the different chapters and with different characters. So the art styles that Campbell is using have been called a liberated penmanship. And also the, the, it's based a little bit on the Impressionists, which are also of that time. So once again, the artist took up some time 
to think about how things were being presented during this period of time. During the period of time that we read all those stories about Sherlock Holmes, during the period of time where we read Devil in the White City about what was going on with the Chicago World's Fair and with H.H. Uh, H. Holmes, we are still in this period of time. So this is your pick, Chip, and you've you've alluded to it a little bit there, that we are reading this book for a very specific reason, where it intersects with what we read uh, for the last 127 episodes of this show. And, and I think that we want to mention that the book we read last time, which was nonfiction that uh, read like fiction, this one is fiction that uses, I guess, truth to, um, as the background, sort of plausibility as the background, based on a lot of research that Alan Moore did to put this story together. I really liked, um, I like that Alan Moore has all of these end notes so that you can actually read through his research. Does a great job of that, just like Larson did, of actually showing you the research. Now, I think it's fascinating that he bases the general plot, because of course, the Jack the Ripper story is just this huge moment in Victorian culture, right? Like it gathers together so many of the anxieties of the period, especially those around gender, which we're going to talk about plenty today because it's a huge issue in these first four chapters. But these anxieties about urbanization, globalization, gender, uh, good and evil, Hobbes versus Locke, how are people constructed? How do you create a society, especially in a technologically advanced world? The serial killer captures all of those anxieties. And the thing about Jack the Ripper, unlike H.H. H. Holmes, we don't know who Jack the Ripper was. We'll never know. I mean, and people love creating different stories about who Jack the Ripper might have been. Was he a doctor? Was he a mailman? Was he? There's a whole whack of different theories. And so Alan Moore tells us in his notes that he based this story with a royal connection on Stephen Knight's book, The Final Solution. And then he characterizes that book and says it was possibly, quote, intended as an ingenious hoax. Now, when I saw that Stephen Knight had written a book called The Final Solution, I got really excited because Stephen Knight is one of my favorite detective scholars. He's written over 30 books. He's this older scholar, uh, a UK guy, also teaches at the University of Melbourne. I was like, wow, I didn't even know about this work of his. And then I went, different Stephen Knight. <laughs> so oh. <laughs> <laughs> I see <Stephen> Knight, <laughs> whose work on European detective fiction is like excellent, is not the guy who wrote this book and died at age 33 of a brain tumor and wrote some pretty interesting things. And so that was, I mean, I guess it is a common name, but like my Stephen Knight reviewed my tenure file at UK. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway please note did you guys note the name of stephen knight's book the final solution yes pam that sounds very <laughs> familiar doesn't it that is certainly something that arthur conan doyle was certainly would have used for his sherlock holmes work so it's an allusion to Sherlock Holmes is the final problem, but then of course it's also an allusion to the Nazi final solution. And so Michael Chabon actually has a pastiche of Sherlock Holmes, also called the final solution that, that came out about a decade after this. I didn't think Michael Chabon might have been actually referencing Stephen Knight's book. He could have been, I don't know if that's true or not. So the research is fascinating. And I love Chip, I love your point that this is clearly fiction, that Many, many people write fiction about Jack the Ripper because it's such a great topic and we'll never know the answer. But it's a kind of neat combination of fiction and nonfiction, just like Larson, but going in the other direction. It's got great verisimilitude. <laughs> Bonus, three points for the Fetter home. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, for bringing vocabulary to this show. Classing up the place. <laughs> There's the militude and metafiction, my friends. It's what we're all about. <laughs> so this story opens with a frame story with the investigators of this case talking in the future of this story about how this all happened. And we get some very interesting viewpoints from that. 
from 1923. So just to, to give you an idea of where our prologue starts, where these uh, two gentlemen talk, the, the uh, murders happened in the, you know, the 1880s. Um, so this is certainly a, a while later. And we had a very similar frame story in The Devil in the White City, where we had the main characters in 1912 uh, living their lives after the actions of the story. This is a great way to spark our interest in what is going to happen by looking at it from the perspective of the future. We get some interesting storyline here in the... Stephen Knight story, this connection to royalty is brought up as the possible solution to the Jack the Ripper story, huh? And I have to say, I was not familiar at all with this version of the Jack the Ripper story. It's fascinating. So I can't, I mean, I can't wait to read on. I stopped after chapter four, but this idea that there's an illegitimate royal baby who's at mm-hmm. the of the Jack the Ripper murders and that Queen Victoria would have hired a doctor to commit those murders. Pretty fascinating. And then, you know, using the fascination with the Freemasonry, the the, mm-hmm. the fraternity to sort of help this cover up and then ultimately probably have another part uh, to play here. So this is certainly, there's a, there's a lot going on between the royal family, sort of this event happening and, you know, the, the secret society. And isn't it funny how we've seen those things like in Sherlock Holmes, how in two or three different stories, there was actually a member of the royal family was behind the person who had hired Holmes. And then when we go to America, he's so fascinated by secret societies. Mm -hmm. These were obviously, you know, important questions on people's minds at this time of the late Victorian period, which is it's just the best period, you guys. End of the 19th century. Such a transitional time. Just for philosophy. Right? For print media, for popular culture. It's the best. So, yay. <laughs> we'll have to continue this exploration then. <laughs> well, I'll bring the Paps Blue Ribbon and the Vienna yes, Beef. exactly. And we'll and be we'll fine. And all their shredded doormats as we talk. <laughs> Oh, Pam. The best. We'll meet, we'll meet over at our local lodge and we'll just, you know, we'll do what they are. We'll have some rituals <laughs> and some symbolism. Oh, we'll get to the symbolism. So the, the architecture here is certainly on display as a part of, of what we're... Boy, didn't we talk about architecture with the last book? Right? <laughs> I just thought that was so interesting that when we get into Dr. Gull's Dark Mind... He's all fascinated with Nicholas Harksmore, the architect who had built the church that he's in front of. And then it turns out a a bunch of different buildings in in London. And chapter four, my goodness, we could have spent this entire episode just on chapter four. I know, Steve, you would have enjoyed Mm. Um, <laughs> I, my wife will tell you the story of me reading chapter four and shouting out loud. I get it. I get it. The obelisks. There's obelisks. Oh, well, yes. There are a lot I of get symbols it. in this. We'll talk Oy. about that. But but what about the idea of chapter four is like a 33, 35 page chapter of the doctor and the coachman driving through London, looking at architecture, looking at maps, and looking at the ways that a culture's mores, like a culture's ideas of itself and its identity, get embodied in a city's architecture. Like London comes alive here in a way that I thought was so similar to Eric Larson's examination of how architecture shapes Chicago, not only Chicago as a city, but like who you guys are for living in or near that city. So, I mean, it's kind of amazing, right? Well, it's almost like Dan Brown was right there, ready to write something with him. (laughs) And and I really love Dan Brown's ability to show us the, the, the locations that he's writing about. He is able to bring those things to life. Here we have these images in the graphic novel. And I gotta tell you, as somebody who has been to London, Eddie Campbell really was able to draw pictures of locations that I recognized in this. With that really cool impressionistic style. Correct. But very recognizable, agreed. Very cool. So, 
we we've chosen a graphic novel. How does that imagery of that graphic novel change the way that you are reading this, Pam? So I have to say, I I haven't read a million graphic novels like you guys have, especially you, Chip, but both of you have read way, way more. I didn't grow up reading comic books. I'm a very slow reader of the graphic novel. And I find that, I mean, I'm a relatively, I read like for a living. And so I'm a relatively quick reader normally. I do a lot of audiobooks. So taking a graphic novel in my hand, and I did read the print copy, really, really slows. It's a very slow reading experience where I do read the text and then I pause and I really, really look at the images carefully. I don't, my eye does not slide over. And so I really dwell and I really enjoy that experience, but it is a bit time consuming. So I would read the 120 pages we read for today took me a couple extra hours than a hundred pages of prose would have. Interesting. There were fewer words to read. I did get catch, caught up in those pictures and I find it really fascinating because I mean, I obviously love reading. I love prose. I love the way the images get created in your own mind. And here someone's providing you the images. And so there's a sort of cognitive dissonance between, for me, because I'm not an everyday graphic novel reader, there's this dissonance where I'm like, okay, those are the words. Oh, those are the pictures. They're, they, sometimes they match up with my mind, sometimes they don't. And they really lead you cognitively into this meshing of the visual and the linguistic. So it's pretty cool. How about you, Chip? Well, when I, last week, when we were finishing up Devil in the White City, I actually went to a comic book on H.H. Holmes that Mm. the artists had drawn out the maps of where the events took place and also sort of the maps of where he took those families as he was going everywhere. And what it allowed me to do is, is truly conceptualize how much effort was taken to to put this all together. And I I find um, that with graphic novels, especially with something as dense as Moore's writing and as thoughtful as Campbell's artistry, they really do bring you into a world. It's it's not a movie. Um, It's not a book in the the sense of reading a short story or something like that. It it is an experience that can take a lot longer. Also, it could be very quick, depending upon you know, how it's, something is, is written. You could, you could write something to be very quick. But with more, it really is kind of a dense style. And I read it through the Comixology app for this time. I actually have a paper copy, which I had the appendix next to me that I could kind of read <laughs> over after, after the, the chapter. But the comicsology, where you miss out is you're looking at a frame at a time, right. uh, a single picture at a time. So you don't see how all the pictures kind of work together on a page or maybe on two pages. But that's how I kind of speed up my reading when I get to something like this. So do you find that you read this faster than Eric Larson's book because it's a graphic novel instead of prose? Well, when I was doing uh, Larson's book, I had the Kindle version and the um, audio version. So I can, you know, with with that, you can almost speed read at times Mm -hmm. because your your brain can move a lot faster than even your eyes. And I enjoy that ability to go out and go for a walk and listen to part of it and then come back and read part of it or, or kind of review something with a graphic novel, yeah, there is no walking. There is no audio <laughs> version of this. Um, you you really do at some point have to sit down and kind of go through it. And like I said, with Moore's work, it's pretty dense, so it can take a lot longer. And while he's not d- direct, he's working with the artist on what the pictures should be. The artist still has control over it. There are ways that someone could write a, a comic and certainly make it very quick. Um, you, you don't necessarily have to make it like Moore's work. Moore's work is yeah, certainly um, more of a, a grown-up way of using this medium. 
And I've been reading it on an iPad, uh, one frame at a time, like you said, and I don't have that index to go back to like you have with the paper copy. And I think that that is intriguing, that he gave you all of his research that he did for each of these ideas. Did that change the way you, you read, Pam, with the index? Absolutely. I loved the index, and I loved knowing, um, especially that I've read a few different Jack the Ripper sort of takeoffs and so it was cool to see the research that went into this one specifically i really appreciated that so what are some of the issues that we should be uh focused on in this writing pam well you know as i was saying the the jack the ripper murder specifically because jack the ripper killed five prostitutes it does draw our attention to treatment of women in the 19th century and to like what kinds of choices women had if they weren't going to be married what were their options and so we do have the notion you know the new woman is like 1890s here we're in the 1880s a little bit before that but we do have like some like lower white collar positions for women we have the governess the typist is coming in the stenographer but really a lot of blue collar women end up with prostitution as their only option. And so this notion of women who weren't protected and who were extremely vulnerable to, you know, to be murdered, but also to just be very considered very disposable members of society. This is a real issue in Victorian England. And so I was just super impressed with the way that Moore and Campbell represent the victims. And there was a line that just really, really stuck with me in chapter three when we read these women who we know are going to be killed because we know the story. And that's, there's so much cool stuff about temporality and time that really, I think, I mean, we'll talk about this. Through, I have a feeling it's going to become even more important as we go through the novel. Like, what are the notions of time? But we in 2020, we know as we meet these women, we're like, wow, Jack the Ripper is going to kill you and we're getting to know you. How nice. Um, <laughs> this is a part of the reading experience. And so when one of the prostitutes says to the other, you know, I, I had a baby, but it died. And the other one says, even born dead, a baby changes our life, I think. Hmm. I'm like, wow, yeah. like, that's so deep because certainly... Um, and this is this is following a very uncomfortable graphic scene in which a customer, you know, insists that he's not getting what he paid for. Um, but the woman is thinking, oh, my goodness, I don't have my sponge in. So she's not she doesn't have contraception. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she leaves that situation thinking, oh, my goodness, I earned my money, but now I'm probably pregnant again and I can't be pregnant. I can't make money if I'm pregnant. But also loving the baby inside of you. It's a very, very deep moving moment, I thought. Mm -hmm. and, and well presented. I mean, the, so there well are, <laughs> we, the reader, are, are seeing the options, the limited options that these women have. And, and yes, I don't like the graphic nature of the of situations, but I understand that the situations were real. This was, this was what was happening at that time, for sure. And... Are, are still real for a lot of mm -hmm. people in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, this, isn't a, <laughs> this isn't a solved problem um, in, in many parts of the world. And obviously, feminists disagree about legalization versus, um, you know, but there's, there, we mm -hmm. get into the whole philosophy of philosophical conundrums around prostitution, but, um, and sex work in general. Um, I think there's this really great moment in chapter three, which we spend mostly with the prostitutes, where they try to like, they try to pick up some power through words. And I just, I really love this scene where these, the women are talking and they're talking about their very, very limited options. And then one of them says, ha, huh, she's got starvation. You've got plagues. Polly's got death threats. We are the four whores of the apocalypse. <laughs> so. I just, I really love that idea. And again, like if you just look, it's on chapter three, page 15. Mm -hmm. They're standing in front of a church and the sky is all hatch marks and impressionistic. And they're trying to feel powerful 
but they know they're not right they're they're whistling in the dark and they know it and we know it but boy they're trying to have some sort of power in this in this really completely deadening situation and, and using maybe a little bit of humor to kind mm -hmm. of uh, to put their, their their plight there and even throughout as we build up to this this scene that they use humor to kind of converse with each other yeah you know, after the event happens they meet at the bar they get a drink they they're they're kind of uh, talking about their situation, they're talking about the, what their worries are, and then you're, you're right, they, they recognize that not only are they, they powerless, interestingly enough, they're moralized because of the events that will happen to them, but for the other people who are in their similar situation, they may never be noted in life. That's right. Mm, I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. And after that horrors of the apocalypse comment, when we turn the page, it's just so funny. I'm sorry. The four horrors of the apocalypse <laughs> is just hilarious. Starvation, plague, and death. That that's that's good writing for sure. But it's like hilarious and heartbreaking at the same time. Absolutely. That's what makes it, it it's so poignant. Powerful. It is poignant, yeah. but whores it versus horsemen, funny. it's hilarious. <laughs> and then when we turn the page, we get Mr. Sickert who finds Annie in the middle of the street. Now, Annie is a great character, the candy shop girl we met at the beginning, who ends up having this illegitimate baby. And because she's so inconvenient, what happens to her is what happened to a lot of Victorian women is using this medical discourse around hysteria. She gets committed to an asylum. She is a hundred percent sane. Mm -hmm. And this is something, this is something there's tons of Victorian novels written about this plight that happens to, she's a candy shop girl. It also happens to like more middle or upper class women as well. So, so this is another plight. So what are the options for these women, right? They could become prostitutes. They could be committed to an asylum um, because of an illegitimate child, whereas the father of that child is not punished at all. There's a mm. standard that's being played with. So, so I feel like that from that funny moment of the horrors of the apocalypse, we go to an even more, here's a moment with no humor at all. A woman who's been committed to a rather horrifying asylum who has no options whatsoever. Well, I, I'm going to say it's even darker than that because she's not only committed to an asylum, the queen has authorized a, yeah. the, the doctor to perform surgery on her, remove a thyroid that made her unable to think clearly. So obviously now she is in the asylum. I'm trying to think of like the Kennedys had a similar situation with, I think their daughter. Um, anyway, this is, this is awful. The, her mind was taken away from her. Mm -hmm. She was a mom in a loving relationship um, with a person she didn't realize was part of the royal family, and then um, she is inconvenient. So they, this is what this is what they do to people who are inconvenient. That's it's so such a strong scene because we saw her as a viable, important part of the story, and then it was just decided that she needed to go away. So she was, they they were told that no, 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 the things she's saying are nonsensical ravings of a mad woman. But we know as the readers that she's telling the truth. This is what really happened, and uh, boy, that that was a strong moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and having her child taken away so not only is she committed to an asylum against her will but but her she does not have her child mm -hmm. there's so much symbolism in this we talk a lot about symbols and uh the, the way of thinking that that these humans tend to do <laughs> these my, humans uh yeah <laughs> one of the my favorite quotes is he says why consciousness itself is not but symbols metaphors which build upon themselves and thus extend their metaphysical domain what an interesting 
way of thinking Moore has to think of consciousness itself as just symbolism that lives in your brain. Yeah. And I mean, when you think about, too, the power of metaphor, right? So there's this wonderful book called Metaphors We Live By, by Lakoff and Johnson. It's an old book, 1980. But boy, I still use it all the time in my teaching. It's this notion that everything we do and say is built upon metaphor. And all of our thoughts are processed through our language. And lots of linguistic analyses of different people with different native languages, you do really think differently in different languages. And so I love this notion that like little squiggly symbols, our words, and then the combination of words and images allow us to live in the world. And especially during COVID, as we live more and more of our lives online, that becomes even more true. And, and, and you know, the, the, there's, it even goes even further that part of at least many religions or many uh, uh, philosophies, the idea that as you move through life, you move through the different stages or, and, and you become sort of awakened um, to a, a different level of looking at things and you know, maybe even reading something on the first time is on one level, but on another time it takes a whole different um, uh, meaning to you. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, Darmok so. and Jalad at Tanagra. There we go. <laughs> I wish one of you knew what the heck I was talking about. No right idea now. what you're talking about. Oh, my, my friends, is Doctor my, Who. I, I nope, 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 not Doctor Who. Would you like to guess again, Mr. Hessenflow? Oh my goodness, I have no idea. It, it's not Doctor Who, that's a Star Trek reference, thank you very much. <laughs> oh my the goodness. idea of metaphor as language. There is an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation where there is this race of people, they can't be understood. With the, the, the universal translator cannot translate this society's language because their entire language is only those metaphors, those stories passed down from generation to generation, and they express themselves in those metaphors. It's very similar to what we do. We use these metaphors to extend our thinking so that we can express ourselves. And that's what we see in, in a lot of chapter four. And boy, are there a lot of obelisks. <laughs> Lots of obelisks. And, and but you know the, the 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 interesting part about that is, as we're driving around the or the driver is is driving us around, and William Gull is kind of introducing the symbolism to us. We're now looking at things we see every day with a whole different meaning, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Well, and he makes the obelisks, he makes the architectural tour part of the gender analysis. Right. And so and it's it's funny that we're getting all that gender analysis from William Gull, who I presume is about to <clears throat> murder prostitutes. He's the one who's like, you know, women used to have so much more power. And, you know, the the fact of actually birthing children, the procreation of the race, which women have so much more control over than men, because women know who their baby is and men don't, has actually you know, it used to be women, women had power, what does he say, for however many millions of years, and men have taken that power only for the last 10,000. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, and so there's sort of this irony of William Gull being the one to give us like a gender theory lesson. And of course, in 1888, we're just on the eve of first wave feminism. And so this is very much something that people are totally talking about. I mean, Gull asks his driver, Netley, you like women? He's like, oh, I like women. And then he's like, wait, wait, but would you be okay if like women ruled the country? And he's like, no, of course not. <laughs> and so that, so, so, you know, this, this is really this super tense moment of gender relations, which, hey, by the way, we're still in 140 years later. Mm -hmm. I am definitely with Kev Mo on this. Put a woman in charge is one of my favorite blues songs. Uh, yes, yes, I would be okay with the idea of women being in charge because uh, I, I got to tell you, working in a school, I do a lot of work because a, a young lady asked me nicely to do so. <laughs> 
that's how my world works for sure. I love the character of Netley just being that representation of the reader, just going along with this whole ride through London. And I love the joke at the end where Gull tells Netley, you realize that I only share these private thoughts in recognition of your lack of cognizance. And Netley goes, oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> there is well, some humor in this. I don't, I don't know if he's, he's Netley is the everyday reader on this. Netley represents the uninitiated, the, the, the uneducated. I mean, he really is certainly you know, a person who feels very lucky to have his position. And his position is a driver for a carriage. But he's he's the student. He's the one being instructed by Gull. That was my point. Okay. Well, I mean, certainly at the beginning of the chapter, he's like, I want to be just like you. I want to join your secret society. And at the end, he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm horrified by this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all good. Thanks. <laughs> I'm going to go over here and not drive you around anymore. <laughs> so we could talk about the secret society a little bit the idea of the freemasons is presented here in in these chapters yeah how many uh, people have ever um who are not part of the base or freemason um, society um experienced a um a ceremony an, an initiation ceremony mm-hmm and we get a little bit of a view of it here. And it's very similar to what we imagine a, a, an initiation would be. It's kind of like what we talked about a couple of times in Sherlock Holmes yes. and... The in, Valley of Fear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That idea of that secret society and that, that absolute faith in the group and doing what the group asks you to do, despite the, the idea that you think you might get harmed in that initiation. Well, it's, certainly. It's, I guess trust the, uh, the group could be part of that. Certainly you are, um, you are blind and then brought into the light. I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of, uh, uh, parts of that are certainly much deeper than uh, I think our conversation is going to go, but mm -hmm. uh, most of us do not get to see that. And, you know, you can think maybe of Stanley Kubrick's Eyed Wise Shut, where they, you were part of a, a ceremony there, um, or at least brought into a secret society. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was, this is fascinating to me. I think this, I mean, I've read this before. This will play out uh, more as we get through the story on why this, well, I shouldn't say this. Gull starts out as an exceptional person. Gull joins the Freemason Society because it certainly is going to benefit him, and he rises very quickly into it and is entrusted with a, a wide variety of things that most people would not be, which allows him to have access to be able to perform, ultimately, uh, what we will learn to be a um, not just killing but a ritual mm. and mm. service for no one less than queen victoria herself right mm -hmm. <laughs> is a very important point i think we get into a little bit of the metaphysical here the thinking about thinking it's something that i i do all the time metacognition and we talk a lot about left brain thinking versus right brain thinking in these chapters. Uh, Gull has a stroke which leads him to a different kind of thinking. Gull tells Netley about the stroke and the fact that it brought with it hallucinations. Netley, I saw God. I knelt before him and he told me what to do. It's interesting to me that Moore writes about this being a hallucination, a, a non-truth, but also that it is a truth to Gull that this is what happened and I am going to do what God told me. And one of the things that I really liked about that portion, as well as really this entire first four chapters, is that Moore brings up these fascinating ideas and he gives you some of the philosophers and writers who have thought or talked about them. So for example, as he's talking about right and left brain, he talks about how time is a human invention, right? And so that, that comes up a couple of times throughout. And then it also comes up 
in a more literary way when Annie tells us that she named her baby Alice after Alice in Wonderland. And Alice in Wonderland, of course, goes down this rabbit hole into a place that is outside of time. <laughs> Did you just say Alice in Wonderland goes down a rabbit hole? What should I have said? <laughs> because it's literal. It's a literal rabbit hole in yeah. Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, absolutely. And, so and figurative. And that, sorry. No, of course I said that. <laughs> where our metaphor comes from, right? Of going down the rabbit hole. I was like, oh, no, did I misspeak? But, no. but when she goes down that rabbit hole, like, you know, the, the issue of time, like Wonderland has a whole different sense of time that Alice brings back up into the world with her, Right. And so, like, for example, one of the wonderful moments that I think sort of mirrors our experience of reading this novel is in Wonderland, one day Alice meets Humpty Dumpty and she's reading Jabberwocky, this wonderful nonsense poem. It was brillig and the slithy so did guy the and gimble gimble in the wobby. Blah, 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 right? The best, <laughs> the best nonsense poem yeah. ever. The Muppets he's did that. Just so you know, just so you know, <laughs> the reason I know that one is because the Muppets did that with puppets. So thank of you very much. <laughs> so she's reading this wonderful poem and she sees this big egg sitting on a wall and she's like, hello. And the egg says, oh, hi, I'm Humpty Dumpty. Let me tell you what that poem means. Humpty Dumpty turns out as a literary critic. And she's like, hey, buddy, you look a little shaky on the wall. You want to come down? And he's like, no, I'll be fine. But Alice knows the nursery rhyme. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. So as she's talking to this egg, this metafictional egg, she realizes he's wrong. Hmm. He's going to fall and no one's going to be able to put him back together again. And that's the same experience because she comes from a world where Humpty Dumpty has already fallen, but she's in a world where he hasn't yet. He doesn't know he's a nursery rhyme character. He thinks he's fine. Hmm. So that sort of mind leap that puts you in two places at once that's what's happening with from hell because we know these women are gonna die but we're watching them having these conversations and trying to call themselves the whores of the apocalypse right like time time does have this fluidity books can put you into worlds that have already happened right mm -hmm. like when you open a novel and they say Oh hey, it's September eleventh, two thousand one. Let's go grab coffee. You're like, oh dear. yeah, maybe maybe skip no, the coffee no. that day. Maybe right? maybe stay home. <laughs> yeah. So, so so anyway, so I guess I just I'm so impressed. Sorry, I'm like super gushy about this book, but I'm just so impressed with the way that he he has these little literary connections, and I bet there's a million that I didn't see, where I just didn't know the reference or whatever. But each of those references pulls us back to one of his main themes. And, and for those who are not aware of this, um, this is a trope of Alan Moore. Alan Moore is very gifted at doing this. He's done this throughout his writing career. This, this is one of the areas to look for when you read an Alan Moore story. And I'm going to start teaching Alan Moore in classes because, hello, that's what makes literature classes really fun, right? Is when you're in a classroom, some people get some references, some people get other ones, and then together, as a prof, you learn from the students who knew references you didn't, and you can teach students the references they might not have known. And so, uh, I mean, to me, I'm sorry, I should let you guys talk. What references did you guys like or notice? The ones that you wrote down in the notes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm just going to do one more and then I will stop. Okay, so in chapter four, Gull is driving around and poor Natalie, right? You start feeling bad for this guy. Gull starts expounding upon William Blake and I myself have been guilty of doing the exact same thing to poor unsuspecting people. I adore William Blake with his Songs of Innocence and Experience, first major romantic poet. Um, he precedes the others by a couple decades. So poor Natalie is just like, hey, what's up? And, and uh, Gull is like, born in the 18th century, our greatest prophet, William Blake, experienced visions, spoke with Milton's ghost or the Apostle Paul. Sounds barmy. Possibly. And yet, as Alexander Gilchrist, Blake's biographer, suggests, tis but comparatively recently that seeing visions would call into doubt a person's sanity. And he continues on. He's got, like, references. He's giving a lecture, right, to this poor driver who's like, oh, fascinating and here's the thing about William Blake so William Blake 
as discussed at length on this lecture, which I won't read any more of, was, you know, did consider, it had this very, this deep religiosity in his poetry, but it was, he was really interested in like the intersection of the sacred and the profane. But the other thing about William Blake is that he created illuminated painting, which was a technique where you could actually create pictures to go with your poems. He was a printer. Interesting. And nobody mentions that, but hello, great Blake created the first graphic novels. So as you're reading this total like lecture about his work on God, which is amazing, he doesn't tell you if you just Google William Blake, Songs of Innocence and Experience, you're going to get these gorgeous pictures, these gorgeous drawings that Blake specifically drew to intersect with his poetry, just as we're getting in this graphic novel. Oh. That's good verisimilitude. <laughs> <laughs> That's twice as you said. Another three points. I'm learning. Three points I'm for the photo home. <laughs> How do you see that as verisimilitude, Steve? <laughs> Is that the wrong word? I used the wrong. Dang it! I failed this test. Professor. Negative, negative three for the photo home. See. <laughs> All right. So look. All right. The sorry, I was so into. Anyway. Okay. I just loved this. I'm so excited. And you guys, we had talked about doing this in only three episodes because it's a graphic novel. Woo! No, no, no. I'm so no. doing four full episodes on this. There is so much. So mm -hmm. here, so much to think and talk about. All right, so look on um, chapter four, yes. there, uh, on page 28 at the bottom. And this is where I think it just gets even deeper. And what, mm -hmm. what do we see down at the bottom? Are two crows? Are they crows or ravens? Oh, are they two ravens? I Probably. think they're ravens. I, I'm telling you, there's, there's a lot more going on uh -huh. And then we may, um, and for those who are not aware, Odin had two ravens. And they were um, uh, memory and... Um, oh, well. of course they're ravens then. Oh, of course. So, so when we, we think about, you know, there is a, there's a lot, there's a lot to enjoy about right. going through something as absolutely gruesome as this this will turn into. And that's a great example of a reference that I didn't know that you just gave me. And, you know, you may not have known the Blake thing. And so this is where, like, talking about graphic novels of this quality with other people, the book club, it just, it's, it just gives you so, so much. And lots of obelisks, Steve. Uh, chapter four, subtitle, obelisks <laughs> and the gender analysis that goes with looking at the phallus as an art oh. and, and a penis yeah and then take, thanks for that pam take, thanks for that and taking this this ride around london only to put together the map where everything will take place <laughs> exactly. and then you guys the final not to do endings. We, I always do endings. Forgive me. But as we get to the ending, we get to, at this next horse, tethered there, inspect the brasses. See? A sun, a moon. Says Gull. Hey, look, the moon and the sun are symbols of everything. And of course, he genders them, as people have often done. And on the next coach and the next, and every coach in London, Netley, every single coach, Netley, vomits <laughs> you know as people sometimes do in the face of complex gender analysis <laughs> you see destiny is inscribed upon the streets wherein you grew upon the horse you ride each day you cannot change your mind Ugh, more vomiting sounds our story is written netly inked in blood long dry and so there's this notion that like as more is writing this in 19 in the 1980s again, to be published serially, this story is already written. It's written in this sort of hoax, and then it's written in the public imagination. It's a story that's, that's being written and already written at the same time. And then when we turn the page, we just get this wonderful long view of the city of London with the full moon. He's mentioned werewolves. And he says it's written in blood and graved in stone. Amazing. Love it. Oh, yeah. 
I, I'm glad that you're enjoying this. You you obviously are enjoying this a lot more than I am, and that's okay. That's kind of <laughs> the point of a book club is to is to take a look at these books and to hear different perspectives. I'm going to add one part to this. Um, I, I don't know if Moore wrote this or Eddie Campbell or if they wrote it together, but the book was there was a dedication, and I, as I'm looking through the notes, I, I, I pulled it out because I felt it was poignant. He goes, "The book is dedicated to Polly Nichols." Annie Chapman, Liz Stride, Katie Eddowes, and Marie Jeanette Kelly. And you and your demise of those things alone, we are certain. Good night, ladies. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's very powerful. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, uh, we're certainly talking about life and death here. We're certainly talking about what what happens in this life and how how we can impact each other and how we can make a difference. And boy, we could, we could really change someone's life by uh, small moves. And in, and in the case of some of these stories, really big moves, like putting somebody into an insane asylum because you wanted to keep them quiet. Uh, there's, there's a lot of power to this book for sure. I hope everybody is reading along with us, uh, Are, enjoying it. We, enjoying uh, it. <laughs> All right, so we have uh, our, our new assignment is chapters five through eight. Correct. And those are for so next for, Tuesday. For next Tuesday, your assignment is chapters five through eight, the next four chapters of this very large collection of interesting images and, and gory details. Uh, yes, I hope you're enjoying it <laughs> in, in whatever way that you can. Don't forget the obelisks. <laughs> <laughs> How can you forget? They're right there. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, Chip. I think we have enough obelisks to, <laughs> to survive another week. What do you think? Only if we can come back next week, Stephen Pam. How about Pam? What do you th- what do you think, Pam? I'm good. I'm enthusiastic to read the next four chapters. That's great. I, I'm glad that you're enthusiastic <laughs> about this this writing. Uh, it, it's intriguing. At least. If you need more information, if you have something to tell us about your adventures through from hell, we would love to hear from you. Give us a call or a text. Our phone number is 805-410-4867. Our website is sandwiches at irregularhours.com. Our email is sandwiches at irregularhours at gmail.com. We're on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. We're on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and YouTube. You can find us everywhere. I want to thank you again for listening to Sandwiches at Irregular hours i'm steve foder i'm chef s and gloves and i'm pam bedon we'll see you in the future what i want to talk about what i want to thank you for what i want